All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our second Saturday education series. Um, we and Huyo Ko'olau Poco have been hosting these series um, throughout the length of COVID in a way to reach out to other organizations and to our community and supporters and getting a chance to dive deeper into some of the practices that HOK employs in the field, doing virtual project sites, but also looking at organizations that are doing similar work around Cold Al Poco and around the island. So we've gone into depth with propagation, different types of propagation from seed collection and seed sowing to um, cuttings. We've had some awesome guest speakers, including our own staff and Kupu members um, presenting on topics of their choice and things that interest them. And this month we have our guest Erin from Oahu Invasive Species Committee here to talk to us about all the work that they are doing on Oahu with invasive species. And there are similar organizations on every island or for the different counties. I'm sure Erin will tell us a little bit about that as well. But if you're joining us on the Zoom platform, feel free to chat your questions into the chat box and we will make sure to get to some of those questions. If you're joining us live on Facebook, you can ask questions there as well and we can try to get to them during the live discussion or we will follow up and answer them um, after the discussion. And if you're interested to look back on this presentation or any of our past presentations, you can find them on our YouTube channel and I'll drop a link to the YouTube channel in the chat box as well. So without any further ado, I will pass it over to Erin from Oahu Invasive Species Committee. Thanks for joining us, Erin. Hey, Nalani, thanks for having us this morning and thanks to everybody joining us. Uh, today, I just want to talk about some things that OISC works on and why it's important. So we'll talk a little bit about terms, what it means to be a native species, the difference between a non-native species and an invasive species, those impacts, um, how different organizations manage invasive species. And I'll talk about two of OIS targets that we um, work on in the Kotla Poco watersheds, which are Myconia and Rapid Okia death. And then we'll get um, just a little overview on what you can do to help us. So let's get started. So aside from habitat loss, invasive species pose the biggest threat to natural resources today, and it's often the biggest challenge to resource managers. Numerous state agencies and other organizations manage for invasive species <clears throat> all across the state, such as Department of Health. They're concerned with disease vectors like mosquitoes and rats to really large scale projects like ungulate management and forest restoration, which are really headed up by Department of Land and Natural Resources. This also includes smaller organizations like Hawaii Ant Lab. That's that um, cute little surfer guy with the ant. They target invasive ants like little fire ant. And then coconut rhinoceros beetle response. So there's a lot of different organizations that work on invasive species, <clears throat> but the ISCs are a little bit different than all the rest of them. Our main goal at uh, the ISCs are to control, contain, or eradicate some of the worst invasive species that are not yet widespread. So our goal is to stop us from feeling those impacts of invasive species. Now, every island has their own invasive species committee. And the reason this is a county-based effort is because we all have different invasive species issues on islands. So there's a BISC, a MISC, a MOMISC, an OSC, and a KISC. And the reason for this is, like I said, different targets. So if you're on Big Island, you um, are really familiar with Koki frogs. They're widespread. It's highly unlikely that they'll ever be eradicated from that island. So therefore, they're not a target for Big Island Invasive Species Committee. But if you hear a Koki frog on Oahu, this is a target of ours, and we will help Department of Agriculture respond to those calls. Another example of this is the mongoose. Um, this is a widespread invasive species on Oahu, um, and, but it's not widespread on Kauai. So if you saw a mongoose and you were on Kauai and reported it, KISC is going to go out and target that invasive species. So this gives you an idea of why we have different targets. Another reason is we have limited funding and smaller staff, so we really don't have the resources to target some of those widespread problems like mongoose here on Oahu. However, I don't expect anybody to really know which invasive species 
are issues for which island and you don't have to. So the great thing is that no matter what you see, if it's weird, you're not sure if it's stinging you, you can report it to the statewide pest hotline. And you can do this through a free smartphone app, 643 Pest. You can do it online at 643pest.org, or you can just call the phone number 643pest. And then your call gets filtered out to the appropriate agency. Now, the reason invasive species are such an issue for Hawaii um, really has to do with the evolution of native species here on the islands. Hawaii started to form about 70 million years ago and were the most isolated island mass and land mass on the planet. So over the course of 70 million years, plants and animals that did finally make it their, make their way here, they did so without the aid of human beings. And this is what we call native species. They arrived with the aid of the wings of birds, the waves of the ocean, and the wind. Over the course of 70 million years, based on all the native species that we know about, the average for arrival is about once every 10,000 years. Would a plant or animal actually make it to the islands? It has to make it here, survive that journey, but then it has to thrive and have offspring. So this didn't happen a whole lot. This is why we have so many native species that are only found here in Hawaii. So if we take our birds, for example, a single finch species came to Hawaii, but over millions of years without threats of other introduced species, it was able to evolve in a variety of species that are now only found in Hawaii. Oftentimes when these endemic species um, evolve into their new species, they lose a lot of their defenses, so they're very vulnerable. So when we talk about those native species, we've got the endemic species that you only find here, like our okia trees, and then you have what's called indigenous species like Ilima, so it's native here, but also elsewhere in the world. When we talk about non-native species, the general definition is just anything that got here with the help of people. So it could be on purpose or it could be on accident. These are two examples of non-native species, plumeria and octopus tree. One's bad, one's not, right? You can plant a plumeria tree in your backyard. 20 years later, your neighborhood isn't overrun by plumeria trees. It doesn't have that invasive qualities. But octopus tree, you're gonna notice on the windward side of the Ko'ula Mountains is completely dominating much of the slopes. So the answer is not all non-native species are invasive. Things like kalo, banana, coconut, mango, and plumeria, these are all beneficial uh, plants that we have that are not native to Hawaii, but they don't cause problems. In order for something to be called invasive, it has to harm one or all four of these things, our economy, health, environment, or quality of life. If it harms all four of those, it's a really bad one. So mosquitoes are a really good example of this. They impact all four areas of our lives, our economy, health, environment, and quality of life. The reason invasive species are so good at being bad is because they have these qualities. They can live just about anywhere. A rat can live in Waikiki dumpsters. It can also live up in the forests. They reproduce very quickly. So mongoose, they only live for about four and a half years, but a female can have about 27 babies in her lifetime. They also outcompete for resources. <clears throat> so things like strawberry guava use up a lot of space, water, and they completely take over a spot. And then things like feral ungulates, other than people, don't really have any natural enemies, predators, and then often no disease here on the islands to keep their populations in check. So when we think about invasive species taking over, as you go through time, as time goes along and they're unmanaged, the cost of managing them increases, also the impacts increase. And so that's why at OS we work really in these early areas, because like I said, we have a limited amount of staff and a limited amount of resources and no dedicated funding. So that helps us choose our targets. What can we actually get rid of? What's gonna cause the most problems? When you look at where OISC works on the island, um, you don't have to really look at this map and figure out what icons mean. I just really want you to know that we work all across the island. We work on private property and public property. And that's because invasive species are not bound by property lines. Oftentimes we work in highly residential areas because our invasive species are not yet widespread. And as we know now, invasive species are introduced with human activity. So a lot of times we're already working in heavily invaded forests, but what we wanna protect are those native forests, those watersheds that give us all those ecosystem services. The first target I'd like to talk about is Myconia. I'm not sure how many of you have ever seen this. Hopefully on Oahu you have not, because that means that we're doing our job. 
But Myconia is native to South America and it's really good at being bad. Um, it's very easily to identify. It um, can grow as a tree, get about 50 feet tall. And it's got these really long leaves. The leaves can get up to about three feet long. They're purple on the bottom and green on top. It also is uh, rapidly matures. So it can mature and start producing seed in as little as four years. And each plant can make up to 9 million seeds each year. Nobody really knew how bad Myconia was until somebody went to Tahiti. And in Tahiti, it is called the green cancer or the purple plague. It was introduced there in 1937 and in just 30 years, it took over about 40% of their forests. It's directly impacting their native species, threatening them with extinction. Here you can see, this is in Tahiti, a hillside that's completely overgrown with Myconia. Because Myconia grows so rapidly, and this is true of a lot of invasive plants, they have this very shallow root system. So what happens is it doesn't hold the soil and you get these high erosion events and landslides. Because all of these trees have been pumping out 9 million seeds a year, and another bad thing about Myconia is those seeds can last for at least 20 years in the soil, the only thing that's going to grow back in that area is more Myconia because it grows faster than anything else and it's just a big thick seed bank of Myconia seeds. So when someone went to Myconia, they figured this was a bad idea, we should target this in Hawaii. So how did it get here in the first place? Myconia was actually introduced to the botanical collections in 1961, starting at Wahiwa Botanical Gardens. And then sort of moved its way over into Manoa at Lyon. And then by the 1990s on Oahu, Myconia had made its way into private collections. As you saw in the pictures, it's a really unique looking plant. It's got those large, pretty leaves. But back then, people didn't realize the impacts of Myconia. After that, it had also made its way to Big Island, Maui, and Kauai. In the 1990s, it was deemed a noxious weed, and control efforts started. So I talked a little bit about how it's good at being bad. And what OS does is we try to find these plants before they mature. We wanna stop and sort of exhaust the seed bank that already exists on Oahu. So we look for plants that are teeny, teeny, tiny um, up to trees. Uh, the picture here on the right, that's one of our field crew taking down the largest tree that we have recorded on Oahu. This was in the back of Manoa Valley. This was about a 40 foot tree. To give you an idea of what these trees produce, when we cut this tree down, we counted all of these panicles. So these are the flowering bodies of the plant. This 40 foot tree had 154 of these panicles. Each of these panicles contains multiple fruits. And inside of one of these fruits are anywhere from 20 or 50 to 200 seeds. The seeds in the bottom right hand corner you can see are teeny, teeny, tiny. They easily get picked up in soil when walked by um, with people on their hiking shoes, but also pigs. And then in this small bottom center photo, you can see OISC. This is 31 fruits. So if we take how many seeds we know are about in each fruit, there's a potential in this OISC sign for anywhere from 1,500 to over 6,000 Myconia plants. This is how it's so good at being spread. And birds, just like people, also can spread this plant too because the birds will eat the fruits. The reason we're really concerned about Myconia is you saw what happened in Tahiti in just 30 years. We don't want that to happen here. And the reason is because we need to protect our watersheds, which um, provide us with all of our water that we have on the island. We don't have rivers and lakes to draw fresh water from, so our watersheds and our forests are so important at capturing and recharging our waters for us to use for agriculture and in our everyday life. The photo on the left shows what it looks like to be inside of that Myconia forest in Tahiti. You can see it's a very dense canopy. There's almost no substory, and then there really isn't anything covering the ground. It's all exposed soil. So when you have these heavy rain events, there's no multi-layer multiple layer forest to slow the water down to allow it to not only just run away with all the soil and increase sedimentation, but to seep into our aquifers and recharge those ever so important um, aquifers and source of water. The photo on the right is a native forest here in Oahu that's in the northern Koolalaus at the Poemo Summit. You can see that this is a multiple layer 
It's a canopy with ferns and mosses and trees that helps to slow the water down and capture the water. It's like a giant living sponge. So once Myconia gets a foothold, what ends up happening is you get reduction of the water capture, erosion, loss of topsoil, and sedimentations of your surface waters and also your nearshore reefs. The potential for Myconia is the potential habitat for Myconia. It's a shade tolerant plant. It likes a lot of water. So it's actually our entire Kotla watershed. That's where it wants to live. Our Kotla watershed is responsible for 133 billion gallons of water each year. It provides that water to over 880,000 Oahu residents and provides $14 billion in services like clean water, flood and erosion control, and protecting our nearshore reefs. The Ko'ala Poco Watershed Management Plan looks at a variety of different issues contributing to water concerns in your area. Um, these water concerns include flooding, erosion, and sedimentation. 30 million gallons of water a day are produced and used in these watersheds, nearly all of which is dependent on rains and aquifer recharge in the form of surface and groundwater. Currently, almost 10 million gallons a day are used towards agriculture in the area. The highest projected growth for the agricultural sector by 2030 in Ko'olaupoko is about 57%. So if we want to continue and expand agriculture and increase our food security, we really have to protect these water sources. So maintaining a healthy, resilient watershed in the face of changing weather patterns is extremely important. So we can't let our watersheds become dominated by a single invasive plant like Myconia. Our GIS operator and planner, um, Gene Fujikawa created a model of the potential spread if we stopped all operations at OS on controlling Myconia. This model starts with uh, 380 immature plants and 10 mature plants. And when we run the model to see how it spreads, how far it spreads, knowing how quickly it matures and how many seeds it produces, in just 10 years, you can see that the spread of Myconia not only exceeds our current survey areas, but Myconia then starts to cover the leeward and windward side of the Ko'ola summit watersheds. Another visual that we have for this is an imagery map. This is in Manoa Valley. And in the center of the valley here, you see sort of a single building that's Lion Arboretum, just so you get a reference. This is the same model, but instead of using that, um, the top of map, we have the imagery. And so each one of these red dots represent a Myconia plant. So in 10 years, Myconia will absolutely blanket the valley. And that's not something that we can afford to lose for our watersheds. So the way that OS targets Myconia is that on any given day, we will be hiking in the forest, repelling, surveying by helicopter. And our, our strategy is working. So our first full year of Myconia operations was in 2002. We removed just over 3,000 plants. We surveyed just over 2,000 acres and we had uh, 2,600 people hours, boots on the ground working on this. We have been able in the years since to expand how many acres we survey and how many hours we throw at this problem. And what we see is a decrease of 71% of plants in the year 2020. So even though we're getting lower numbers of plants, which is good, and we're increasing all of our efforts, this is the this is the trend that we want to see. We want to see less plants and less mature plants so that we can keep this at bay. The next target species I'd like to talk about, this is pretty new for um, Hawaii, is rapid ohia death. There's been a lot of attention towards this just because this is a really um, ecosystem changing invasive issue. So the reason we're concerned about this is ohia is one of those endemic trees that's only found in Hawaii. It's highly variable. There's five species and many different varieties. It can grow from a coastline up to 9,000 feet. And it's also a pioneer species. When you go to Big Island, it's one of the first things that will grow on those lava flows. And as it expands its roots, it breaks up the lava, creating soil so that other plants and animals can then get blown or flown in by birds and start to grow. It's the dominant tree in all of our wet forests on all the islands. There's over 800,000 acres of ohia forest across the state. Um, over half of that is on Hawaii Island, and most of our native ohia forests you find on the summit. The easiest place to see a native ohia forest is as you go over the 
H three headed windwards um, on the leeward side before you go through the tunnels. If you really stop and look around, well, not stop on the highway, but if your passenger look around, you're going to see a lot of Ohia forests, a lot of Ohia trees and koa trees. That's what a native forest looks like, and that's what we want to protect. The reason it's so important is that 40% of our ground above ground carbon capture is provided by Ohia forests. They're very essential to our ecosystems. So rapid Ohia death is actually a fungal disease that attacks the sapwood in the tree. It's all new to science. They had never seen these species of fungus before. So because of that, they have uh, Hawaiian names. There are two different species of rod. Uh, one is Ceratocystis luku ohia. This is the most aggressive strain of the fungus. The less aggressive is Ceratocystis huliohia. Luku means to destroy and huli means to slowly turn over. The less aggressive, even though it might take more time to kill the tree, it still kills the tree. The way that it gets into the tree is that it has to enter a wound. This is a fungus that attacks the inside sapwood of the tree and it chokes off all the water supply. So it's not something that you're gonna see on the leaves, you won't see it on the bark, you're not gonna see it on the ground. It lives inside the tree. The way that rod moves around is, of course, by humans, we can move it around because those fungal spores can be on the ground and we can track that in dirt on our shoes and on equipment and vehicles. It can also be moved around when we move infected Ohia posts or logs. It can live for years after an Ohia tree is cut. As long as the Ohia tree is damp or that log is damp, the fungus can survive. It also moves with beetles. So the picture of the beetle is an ambrosia beetle. It's a boring beetle. And as it bores through the tree, it actually bores through the sapwood layer of the wood and creates a hole. So that allows those spores to escape through that hole and then get blown around by the wind. As I said before, the tree has to have a wound in order for it to get infected. The tree is not going to get rod through its root system taking up water. It has to have a, a wound in its bark so that the spores will land on the wound and then start to infect that sapwood. It's much like humans. When we get a cut, if we don't clean it out or cover it, it's going to get infected. The symptoms that rod presents are dead or dying leaves. It looks like a very sick tree or a dead tree. Oftentimes this, um, this choking off of the water happens pretty quickly, so the leaves will remain attached. So things that you wanna look for is, could just be the entire brown crown of a tree, or it could just be a branch. Half of the tree is living, half the tree still has brown leaves attached. When you see symptoms like this, this is what we want you to report. As I said before, you can't see rod on leaves or in the soil or on the ground. It's inside the tree. In order for us to know what kills a tree, we have to take a sample of that wood. There's a lot of things that can kill ohia trees. And one of the most common things that we see, especially with landscape trees or trees in people's yards, is that trees will die because there's either too much herbicide, sometimes um, weed whacking, or if you mow over the roots, that can injure the tree and uh, lead to death like this that on the outside it looks like rod but these trees were tested and it was not rod that killed the trees. So in order for us to know what killed the tree we have to get a sample of that wood. Where is rod? So Hawaii Island and Kauai have both strains of rod. They have the Lukuohia and Huliohia. Maui and Oahu only have the less aggressive species that's been detected and that's the Huliohia. And then there's been no detections of rod on Molokai or Lanai. On Oahu, we've had um, eight positive detections, and these are the watersheds that they were detected in. There's three windward and a few summits. What OISC does is we do aerial surveys of all the Ophia forest twice a year. As we fly, we take GPS points of any suspect trees. Those are trees with the red crowns. And then we'll send in ground crews to go sample for this. We're getting a lot of help with the Division of Forestry and Wildlife and collecting samples. And to date, since this all started in 2014, we've uh, sampled 356 trees. And like I said, eight positives have happened. Three of those um, are on the windward side. Those have all been in residential yards. So just because you have an Ohia tree and it's in your yard, you think maybe, maybe I just didn't water it enough, 
Um, you can always report that to us and we'll come and take a sample of the wood to make sure that it's not rapid ohia death. What we do if it is rapid ohia death is we fell the tree and we cover it with a tarp. So we don't want any more of those fungal spores to be blowing and spreading even further. The good news is, is that most ohia forests are still healthy. However, the potential for damage from rod is kind of scary. So there's a lot of research ongoing to find resistant species and varieties of ohia. There's also resistant or research going on to find fungicides so that we can treat trees um, so that maybe we don't lose them to rod. And there's seed banking going on because forest restoration efforts are gonna have to happen. If you lose an ohia forest, what's gonna move in are invasive species and we don't want that to happen either. So the things that you can do to prevent the spread of rod is don't injure ohia. Um, one of the things that we can recommend is if you prune your ohia tree, you can use spectricide to cover that prune wound to allow it to heal so that no spores will land on it. Also don't transport ohia into island. This means ohia plants, ohia logs, soil, don't transport any of that into island because it could have the fungal spores in it. And don't move ohia wood around. If you are somewhere where you suspect rod to be, or let's say you're on Big Island or Kauai and you know rod is in your area, don't move ohia if you cut an ohia tree down. Also, you want to clean your gear and your tools. After you hike, make sure that all the dirt's off your boot and then you can spray it with 70% rubbing alcohol. Leave it sit for 10 seconds. That will kill the rod fungus. And then wash your vehicle if you do off-roading, um, if you bike, if you motocross, you wanna make sure that you clean all the dirt off of your soil so that the next place you go, you're not introducing those spores into a new area. Overall, with any invasive species, there's a ton of stuff you can do. The most easy thing you can do and the passive way you can participate in invasive species management is that if we call you, allow us to survey your property. As I said before, invasive species don't really, they're not contained by private property boundaries. So when we ask to survey someone's land or their yard, it's because we want to ensure that our target species is not present. And if it is present, remove it from the ecosystem. The other thing you can do is report, like I said before, you don't have to know every native plant, invasive plant, non-native plant. If you see something odd, you can take a picture and report it through the 643 Pest app. And then stay in form and decon between your hikes. So when you go hiking, make sure that you clean your shoes after. You never want to start a hike with dirty shoes because you could have myconia seeds or rod fungal spores in that dirt. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website so you can get more details about our other target species like little fire ant or tibicina. And you can volunteer if you really want to get involved. This website, conservationconnections.org, has volunteer opportunities that are available statewide. And it allows you to filter if you want to volunteer focusing on Malka or Makai regions. And before I go, I'd really like to say a big mahalo to our crew so you can get to know the people that are doing all this amazing work. Our field operations are physically one of the toughest conservation jobs on the island. But when you work somewhere with people who all have the same mission and believe in their job, going to work every day is a blast and your coworkers become some of your best friends. So mahalo to our crew for all the hard work that they put in. And then finally, a big mahalo to our partners and our funders. Without the support um, and funding of a lot of these people, we're not gonna be able to do our work. We'd also like to give a big thank you to PCSU. They're our administrative branch and they help us make sure that we keep all of our operations safe. And so with that, I will take any questions that people might have. Awesome, thank you so much, Erin. Yeah. Um, if anyone joining us today does have questions, feel free to come off of mute and ask those questions. And I'll kind of kick us off with a question. Um, one point in your presentation when you were talking about native, invasive, non-native, you mentioned the word incipient. Can you describe like what that word incipient means in the invasive species realm? And then yeah. we'll go to Lawrence who has a question also. So Yeah, yeah. So incipient is um, another word for it's just not widespread yet. It's kind of new. 
I, I don't like to use new because Myconia, as I said, since the 60s, it's not really a new species, but it's incipient and in that it's limited in its range. So incipient species, is that something that we're still hopeful we can eradicate from the island? Yes. Um, so one of our missions is to, we'd obviously like to eradicate it, get rid of it island-wide. And there's a few species that we've had success with. And then um, if we can't eradicate it, what we want to do is contain it until we can get better tools to help us in eradication projects. Myconia is an eradication project, but like I said, the seeds last for 20 years in the soil. And generally speaking with plants, eradication is three times the seed bank. So if you haven't seen Myconia for 60 years, you can pretty much be sure that it's eradicated. So it's a very long project. So what we're really focused on now, the end goal is eradication, but we have to make sure that we keep it contained. We can't lose the battle to Myconia. Awesome, thanks. Okay, Lawrence, you had a question. Hey, uh, first, uh, let me say that uh, you, you all are doing a great job, and I really, uh, as, as a taxpayer, to think that the money is going to a really good cause. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that you have uh, longevity in your jobs as well, if we're talking about 60 years at least. So um, when we talk about rapid ohia death, um, and you, you say you do the surveys twice a year, so how long does it take for like a mature tree uh, to get to, to die uh, from this. And then number two is like, if you see part of a tree that, that is uh, brown leaves or, or is showing signs of infection, if, you, if that were cut off like a branch or something, would that save the rest of the tree? Or by the time that it shows signs of being infected, is the whole tree infected? Yeah, that's a, those are good questions. Um... Given its name, rapid ohia death, what they were seeing initially was that someone would report the death of a mature tree within weeks. They would say, two weeks ago, my tree looked great. It was blooming. Two weeks later, it's entirely brown. We see, we see the symptoms present differently with the different species. So with Leuco ohia, that's the really aggressive one, that moves all throughout the tree, throughout the sapwood. And that's where you get the rapid death within weeks. With Julio here, it acts more like a canker, so it can start and just sort of turn on a branch. The problem with um, the, the Julio here is that we have done that before. We pruned off a branch, but chances are, and what we have been seeing is that the fungus is still present in the tree. So while it won't kill the tree as quickly as Julio here, it eventually will start to grow in different areas of the tree. So both of them do cause mortality in the tree. They've not seen any tree recover from rod, either species. It's just one happens to happen really quickly, while the less aggressive, the one that we have here on Oahu, happens um, more slowly. And they do believe that the less aggressive one uh, is, has been here much longer than Lukulokia, um, and that's because the trees will die slow, and not many people notice a slow, dry, a slow dying Ohia tree really kicked us off was noticing those trees that were dying within two weeks. And they were seeing a bunch of that happening um, in Hilo and in the Puna district on Big Island. So that's what, that's why they started looking. And that's how they discovered both the strains. Well, fantastic, man. Thanks again. And again, thanks to you and your team for what you do. It really is uh, great to, to see that uh, going on. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, you mentioned some, some wins and some species that have been eradicated. I'm curious to know what those are. Yeah, I think one, um, one that I can talk about just right off the bat is fireweed. So this is um, a really big invasive plant that's on Maui and Big Island. And the issue with fireweed is that it's, um, it's toxic to livestock and it grows very rapidly and will take over pastures. And it's not so much that horses and cattle will eat fireweed, but when, when you do a haying process, the fireweed will get caught up in the hay and they will unknowingly eat it and it can cause um, death in livestock, severe illness and even death. 
And so here on Oahu, we've actually eradicated it twice. Um, the first time it was introduced, it was introduced through um, a hydro mulching product. So that was sourced from Australia. There were some fireweed seeds in that. And then when they hydro mulched the side of a road project, um, fireweed started to grow. So OS targeted that. We were able to eradicate that species um, in that location. And then it was reintroduced to Oahu. We think um, it was either gravel or equipment um, from uh, either Big Island or Maui. So there was a construction project and they were moving a lot of earth. They had moved equipment over from both of those different islands and had sourced gravel from a different island. And so when the construction project was over, um, they saw a fireweed starting to grow. And so we were able to go up there and clear that out of that target location. Um, and then I'm kind of curious to know what other like oddity animals are out there or populations. I know that there's been some talk lately about um, the iguanas in Waimanalo. I'm just curious to know like what other odd species are out there that OISC is aware of or um, working on controlling or are the iguanas a problem or are they just kind of being watched? And not iguanas in particular, but I just, those are one of the ones that kind of catch my eye because I live in frequent Waimanalo, so I'm always on the lookout for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are iguanas in Waimanalo. I've also heard um, of a population, uh, I believe it's around Waihe'e, Waikane area. Um, these are populations that aren't growing or spreading, so it's something that Department of Agriculture is keeping an eye on. One of the issues that just come up so much with invasive species is you have to prioritize based on the resources that you have and what you're able to do. Um, so given if we had a lot more money or a lot more resources um, to do control efforts or like Department of Ag, if they had more resource, resources to do um, import control, import inspections, we wouldn't have such an invasive species problem that we have today. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's an odd one. So it's being watched. Um, there's also um, Cuban night anoles. They're known to be around the mid-Pacific Gulf course um, in Lanikai area. So it's sort of a larger, like if you can imagine a giant chameleon almost, it it's really kind of looks like a dinosaur. Um, but th there's a population of those. Um, in Manoa, there's a population of um, exotic birds. Uh, so if you go back to Manila, you're going to see some exotic parrots. Um, and then, of course, you hear about odd things a lot in the news. So there's been skunks, possums. I think one of the funny, maybe not funniest word for it, but it was like one of the oddest things I heard about. I think it was maybe five years ago, there was a giant um, coconut crab crawling down Salt Lake Boulevard. <laughs> so you can actually go see that crab at the zoo. So they caught it and you can go visit him in his new home. Um, yeah, just strange things pop up a lot. One of the, you get creeped out when you hear things like Brazilian walking spiders found in shipping containers from Brazil. Those are spiders that don't, um, they're not orb spiders. They don't make webs, they actually hunt their prey. So they're quite large, like a dinner plate size and they found two of those. And then they sent that shipping container back to Brazil. So. Weird stuff makes it here. Um, that's one of the great reasons we have that 643 pest hotline. You never really know what you're gonna see. And we don't have snakes in Hawaii, but every year there seems to be snake reports, whether it's a ball python or a boa constrictor or a milk snake, because people will smuggle these illegal pets in. And sometimes they get let go or sometimes they escape. That walking spider just made me, ugh, yeah. I like it. Just close that container up and <laughs> nope, not buy, <laughs> send that back. Um, and when you were talking about Manoa and the exotic birds in Manoa, it made me think of, there's been, um, there's an established population of poison dart, poison arrow frogs, poison dart frogs, but are, they are not poisonous in Hawaii. 
Do I have yeah, that correct? Um, yeah, when you go to Manoa, you'll see these uh, lime green and black. They're small frogs. They're quite cute. Um, they're called poison dart frogs. The reason that they get that name, the poison dart frog, is in their native range, they eat certain kinds of ants. And um, the formic acid in the ants allow them to have a toxic quality to their skin because it gets excreted through their body. And so that's what people would rub their darts on and get their poison dart frog name. But here in Hawaii, we don't have those, those specific ants. So they're not considered poisonous here in Hawaii. However, I would like to mention anytime you handle any sort of um, lizard or reptile or amphibian, they do have the potential to have salmonella on their skin. So you should always wash your hands immediately after handling anything. But they are in Manoa. There are so many odd and interesting things all the time. And every island is so different with the species that they're targeting too, which makes, I'm sure this work um, very tricky to- Yeah. yeah. And then prioritizing. So we're talking about a lot of these invasive species or non-native species. Um, when deciding what you wanna prioritize, what you need to put your resources towards is you wanna do the most with whatever you have. And when you have a little, that's when you have to really prioritize. So when we choose our targets, our main goal is eradication. Can we eradicate it? The second thing is what's the potential impact of this species? I mean, is it really gonna have that big of an impact if we don't target it? And then another thing that we have to consider is um, if we can't eradicate it and it does have a big impact, what's it gonna to take to contain it? Are we gonna be able to contain the species to a certain location so we can minimize the impacts? And then after that, you have to look at the risk of reintroduction. Is this gonna just keep coming and coming and coming? Is there, is there a way to stop the reintroduction of some of these species? Um, I think the biggest challenge right now with invasive species is rapid ogea death because it's a fungus and the spores move around, it's new to science, um, really are just doing a lot of research to find the tools to mitigate that spread and to mitigate those impacts. So I think that that is probably the biggest invasive species challenge right now in Hawaii um, that people are dealing with because there's so many unknown questions, um, but it's got the potential to be so destructive, it has to be addressed. Um, we just had a question come through in the chat. Um, it says, are the invasive birds you mentioned in Manoa the bright green ones? Yeah, the, uh, the, the rose ring parakeets, those are in Manoa, they're Mililani. Um, those are highly invasive birds. It's also a big issue on Kauai. Kauai is doing a lot of research right now, trying to figure out how to um, mitigate those impacts of those birds. Um, the issue with those birds is they roost in one place and then they go eat somewhere else. Um, so they're highly, um, they're a big agricultural pest. And they're also a big nuisance. So if you live anywhere where you get flocks of these, especially if they're roosting in a tree outside your house, you realize how loud they are, the mess that they make. If you're a farmer, especially if you're doing something like lychee, they completely devastate your crops. Um, so there is work being addressed to try and figure out the best way to reduce those populations. Um, one of the options that people throw out there a lot is, can't you just go and shoot them? And it is possible you can humanely euthanize birds. However, with those populations, what'll happen is if you don't get all the birds, they actually, it'll be like one flock will break off into several other flocks and then they go somewhere else and you have to try and find them. So once you locate a flock of those birds, you really have to make sure that you don't disperse them further with um, bad management techniques. So it's a challenge that is um, being looked into. However, um, no, no really good solution has been found yet, but it's not a lost cause and nobody's giving up yet. Um, and then follow up on that, if we see them, is that something to report through the pest hotline? You can report it. Like I said, you can report anything. And they, the good thing is that they'll note a location, even if it's not something any agency will um, is tasked with either managing or um, doing control work on. 
it's something that they log locations. So um, I think if you see them, you should report it. However, there is no agency that does management work on that bird right now though. So you can report it and we can know all the locations and that's good data to have. And then if you do have concerns, um, you can also talk to your um, local legislators and say that this is a big issue for you. Um, you see a little bit more funding towards invasive species management. I have a question um, in particular about Kauai. Um, I really like that map that you had that had like Oahu Island and then like little areas where that were surveyed for the Myconia. Do you guys have like a similar project for Kauai or have an idea of how much is um, impacted that? I'm not sure the, um, I'm not sure where or how many acres Kauai surveys for Myconia. I don't know the acres of their infestation area, but they do have a Myconia program. And if you reach out to KISC at hawaii.edu, instead of OISC, it's just K-I-S-C, um, I'm sure that they have maps that they could share with you. Or if you wanted to see it on their website or social media posts, um, absolutely provide that for you. Yeah, because I think one thing that's really interesting to me is the fact that the Myconia berry carries so many seeds. And the rose ring parakeet population on Kauai is so massive that if they're eating the berry, you know, would that be a problem? Yeah, the way we determine our survey buffers for Myconia is based on um, literature reviews on what we know, how far birds will travel. So mm -hmm. what birds are eating this? Most of them are forest birds like bulbuls. The good thing for Kauai is they don't have the bulbuls. Um, bulbul birds love Myconia seeds, but they do have other birds that will eat them. And we know that 99% of all of Myconia plants fall within an 800 meter buffer. So that's what we survey on the ground. And then there's outliers that can go up to a mile from a parent plant. So we survey a radius of one mile around every known Myconia plant. And um, I'm not sure if there's any research being done on the parakeets and their intersection with Myconia plants. I'm not sure if the parakeets are in those buffer zones, but that's a really interesting point to bring up to um, KISC and ask them if they have any of that data. That's really interesting. Thank you for the information. <laughs> You're welcome. Awesome, thank you so much for your time, Erin. And if anyone does have any more questions, feel free to email us or respond to the, the Zoom link that you were sent to join us today. And we can always get your questions over to Erin at OS or her contact information is all on the screen right now. So um, thank you again for joining us everyone and we'll have this recording up on our Facebook channel for a while and then it'll eventually have a permanent home on our YouTube channel as well and stay tuned to our newsletters and we'll be announcing in early August who our guest presenter for our second Saturday in August will be. Um, yeah so thank you guys all so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed um, all of these series and learning more about different organizations working around. Thank you thank everybody. You. Oh, yeah.